So as we heard, another 25 basis points. What do you make of this latest move? It's basically what all the central banks around the world are doing right now. The U.S., the U.K., the European Union, they're all intent on taming inflation. And what's interesting in every measure, in every country, the thing that has reversed the upward trajectory of inflation, though it's still three times the pace we want it to be, the thing that has reversed the trajectory from going further up has been falling fuel prices, which bank rate hikes have got nothing to do with. It's about global supply. And the thing is, with China reopening its economy after three years of uh, COVID lull in production, it will be chewing up more of that global supply. So we may see prices spike again, notwithstanding whatever the central banks do. It's a bit of a pain point to see that the central banks have to do something, but what they're doing is perhaps irrelevant to what direction prices are going up or down in, other than to squish the economy and make it impossible for people to buy things. Now, you know, reading a piece that you've written, it says here 4.5 percent. That's the highest it's been since December 2007, before the global financial crisis exploded. What does the future hold when we're sitting at a similar rate? Well, that's a great question, and I think the real question mark is, can we hang on to this 2% inflation rate target in an era of completely different fundamental issues in the economy than 30 years ago? This game plan of raising rates till you tame inflation is the official game plan of most countries since the 1990s. But the 1990s saw China come onto the scene, becoming the world's global factory and reducing prices of goods in a way we had not seen in decades. And so we are now looking at perhaps the same tensions in China driving prices up. We're looking at far more frequent extreme climate events that make our food prices go up and our oil prices go up. We are looking at this continued invasion of Ukraine by Russia that is suppressing global exports of wheat. That's why your pasta's up almost 30 percent and your bread prices are up 15 percent. We've got these issues all over the world, and the biggest of all of them is that demographic change is forcing more people out of the labor market than coming in because the baby boom finally aging out of the labor market throughout the whole global north. Whatever country had a baby boom post-war, those people are finally leaving. And that is, all of these things are creating inflationary pressures that make it extremely difficult to keep prices down at the 2% range. And I just don't think that the playbook of the 1990s is fit for purpose in the 2020s. You know, I want to turn back to that in a moment. But first, I want to ask you, because, well, many Canadians, after the eighth hike, of course, must know what this means for them. I know what it means for my mortgage. But I'm wondering if you can break down for, for most Canadians, what does this mean for them? What it means is that the Bank of Canada's move to tame prices is raising the prices of the biggest thing in your, in your household budget, which is housing. It's doing nothing to cool prices, and there's no government action to actually make sure we keep building housing as we pour people into the economy through immigration and temporary foreign workers, which is the Bank of Canada's number one recommendation on how we cool the economy, is that we flood it with more supply of labor. Exactly at the time when wages and working conditions should be improving, we are going to do exactly the opposite. I just think it's an anti-worker agenda, and I don't know why we're doing that when we could be making everybody's lives better. So, you know, you touched on the fact that this is a strategy that has been used Used for decades, and perhaps it's time to retool it. Perhaps there's there's time now to maybe explore a new strategy. What will work better? We know that Canadians, the majority of Canadians, are feeling the pinch of this strategy. It can't be just central bank policies. Look, get. I, I just want to be super clear. I'm an economist. This hurts to try and. Um, shed some light on why economic policy through monetary policy may not be the silver bullet we think. I, and I'm certainly an iconoclast in this, in this vein. Most of mainstream economists are not saying anything like this. But when you take a look at the conditions we are in right now, they are so unlike any of the uh, inflationary periods we had in the 20th century, let alone since the 1990s, that I am reminded in history in Canada, the only thing that looks kind of similar to what we're going through right now is when we emerged from the Second World War and converted our economy from a wartime machine to a civilian machine. And then, too, we had supply shortages. 
we had labor shortages, and we had massive corporate profits. And how did we deal with it? Not primarily through monetary policy, primarily through fiscal policy that taxed excess corporate, corporate profits and recycled the money to build housing, to make health and education cheaper. Okay, fast forward to today. There is a jurisdiction that is doing exactly that right now for energy companies, and that's the European Union. 27 nations that are a dog's breakfast of political ideology have all agreed to tax the excess profits of energy companies by 30% and recycle them into lowering heating bills, which have soared in Europe, as well as making households more energy efficient. We can do far more to make sure people don't go hungry because of these rate hikes, to make sure people remain housed, and we're not doing any of it. We're relying on this 1990s solution for the early 2020s, it's not fit for purpose, in my humble estimation. <laughs> well, we will be hearing from Tiff Macklem uh, at the top of next hour, so we'll see what else he has to say on this. Armin, thank you so much for your time. That is Armin Yalnizyan in Ottawa. She's an economist and the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. Thank you.